For our reading this evening, we will look to the Gospel of St. Luke and the Passion of our Lord and Savior. And going out, he went according to his custom to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was come to the place, he said to them, Pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn away from them a stone's cast, And kneeling down, he prayed, saying, Father, if thou wilt, remove this chalice from me. But yet not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed the longer. And his sweat became as drops of blood, trickling down upon the ground. So far, the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Imagine for a moment waking up on a rocky island in the Mediterranean Sea, only to see on the eastern horizon, completely covered with some 200 Turkish ships, the largest naval armada assembled in the history of the world to date, It is mid-May, 1565, the island Malta. You realize that escape from the island is not reasonable, because you know well that if these Islamic forces are not confronted and turned back now, they will only enslave you later, if not physically, then mentally by way of fear. These same Turks have been raiding the Italian coast for some decades, pillaging, burning, killing, enslaving our fellow Catholic citizens. Their goal? They make no bones about it. Their goal? Rome and the conquest of the Christian West. The complete suppression and destruction of Christendom You are now part of the greatest siege of all time, the siege of Malta. You take some comfort in the fact that you're not alone, but counted among some 600 brave knights of the sovereign order of St. John the Baptist, the Knights of Malta. With the brave and fearless 70-year-old Jeanne de Valette as your leader, Also present are many Spanish and Maltese soldiers, as well as the natives, even women and children, willing to fight unto the death, making just over 6,000 in all. On the other hand, the Ottoman Turks and those 200-plus ships and those joining them from North Africa have some formidable forces. 6,000 cavalry. 6,000 Janissaries, composed primarily of young baptized Christian boys, raised to be fighting machines. Boys forced to convert to Islam while still very young. They were apostates. They remained celibate, being highly trained and dedicated to fight battles. These elite fighting celibate apostates are among the most feared of the Turks. The Ottomans also have a great general on their side, the dreaded Dragut. All in all, cavalry, janissaries, and foot soldiers, the Turks number 48,000. Some 40,000 fighting men. You are outnumbered eight to one. All you have for protection are a few fortifications, that is, some forts with strong walls and citadels and enough provisions to last a few months. But most importantly, you have the faith. The immovable faith, the gift of God from on high, faith that is founded on the rock of God's divine authority. Why do we believe What's the answer to that? Because God said so. That's why we believe. Because God said so. Ultimately, that is it. 
He who can neither deceive nor be deceived said, this is true and I believe it. That's our faith. For their part, the Ottomans have freedom to move about and receive regular fresh supplies and men from North Africa. What is more, they have the high ground. Our forces were not able to secure the high ground against such overwhelming numbers. In other words, folks, they can look down into our forts. They have some 70 cannons, including the largest and best in the world, along with many years of experience in using them. The largest ones can fire 60, 80, and even 160-pound objects. This is 1565. They also have longer rifles for more accurate sniper fire. In other words, they have the latest and best equipment. They have numbers. They got supplies, advanced technology, and the high ground. It is a dreadful and lopsided showdown. Hmm. What's to be done? The God-fearing Grand Master Jean de Valette decides the smallest and most vulnerable of forts, St. Elmo, which guards entry into the biggest and safest of Malta's harbors, is where the Christian forces will take their first stand and fight unto death. The Turks, wanting to dock their huge fleet in the best of ports that Malta has to offer, thinking it an easy and first victory, put their guns in position to take this little outlying fort of St. Elmo, predicting it would fall easily within a week. It is then put under the heaviest barrage of cannon ever experienced until that time. The cannon fire could be heard as far away as Sicily. The fort is pulverized day after day, taking six to seven thousand cannon rounds a day. Yet the fort's faith-filled defenders held their ground. They did not give way, and they suffered no shell shock. Interesting. What is our faith? How powerful it is. Someone described the fort as like a volcano in eruption, spouting fire and smoke daily. So day after day, it was attacked, but it would not fall. Wave after wave of crazed Turkish infantry and Janissaries were repulsed over and over again with great losses on both sides. At night, the breaches in the wall would be repaired for the next day's battle. The weeks became a month with the Turks taking their greatest loss in the death of their prized general, the dreaded Dragut. You are in St. Elmo. The barrage is deafening. The attacks are harrowing. The fall of the fort is inevitable. Rotting and decaying bodies are all around. Why not just pull back and conserve our forces? Why hold out here any longer? It is only being kept alive by a nightly influx of fresh soldiers. This is crazy. This is suicide. One evening, when darkness descended, a dispirited knight reported back to Jean de Valette, a picture of unrelieved gloom. He said, St. Elmo is like a sick man, worn out and at the end of his strength. He cannot survive without a doctor's aid and help. Lavalette replies, Then I myself will be your doctor. I will bring others with me. And if we cannot at any rate cure your fear, we will at least make sure the fortress does not fall into the hands of the enemy. Soon, 50 knights jumped up to volunteer to go along with 200 Spanish soldiers. The wise and faithful Lavalette, he knew the defense of the whole island depended on holding out as long as possible at St. Elmo. He also knew that the viceroy in Sicily was not coming anytime soon to provide the promised relief. Thus, he spoke these profound words, which are very relevant even today. We now know that we must not look to others for our deliverance. It is only upon God and our own swords that we may rely. Yet this is no reason why we should be disheartened. Rather, the opposite. 
And here's the key line. For it is better to know the truth of one's situation than to be deceived by spacious hopes. Our faith and the honor of our order are in our own hands and we shall not fail. The passage from St. James comes to mind. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, which is moved and carried about by the wind. No wavering here. St. Joan of Arc would have been proud to be numbered among his soldiers. The fort held for a month against incredible odds, giving way only on the eve of St. John's Nativity on June 23rd. On June 23rd. How did such a small group of determined men in the small outpost do this? The title of Nicholas Prata's book on this battle says it all. These men were angels in iron. They were angels in iron. They had angelic wills and angelic spiritualities. They were determined and committed unto the end, giving no quarter to the enemy, even when all seemed lost. No wonder then two of the other main forts on Malta were named after the angels, Fort San Angelo and San Michel. After finally overwhelming St. Elmo with great losses, the Muslims crucified the dead bodies of the knights found there and put them on the open waters of the harbor for all to see. Jean de Valette let the Muslims know without any doubt that he would give no quarter to fear and that no dialogue was possible. He let them know that it was a fight to the death. Apart from this great knight, Jean de Valette, I give you three examples of the angelic spirituality and action on Malta. During the heavy fighting at St. Elmo, a French knight of St. John, after being mortally wounded, waved off his companions, saying, Count me no longer among the living. Your time will be better spent looking after our other brothers. While the cannons thundered and the fire rained down from the walls and the Janissaries came on in screeching, screaming, wave upon screaming wave for which they were famous, this good knight dragged himself to the chapel of St. Elmo to be seen no more. Yes, they had a chapel in the fort. In the afternoon, when the knights of the order made their way to this holy place to give thanks for yet another day's amazing victory, they found this knight stretched out dead at the foot of the altar. He made his sacrifice count. These men were angels in iron. Second of all, on the feast of Corpus Christi, even under heavy siege, in the main fort, Jean de Valette and all those who would, could be spared from the defenses joined in a holy procession of the Most Blessed Sacrament. In other words, Christ is King here. Finally, as the knights and the other soldiers fought off the infidel from their designated stations of warfare, the dedicated priests frequently brought them viaticum, the very bread of angels. The connection is clear. The Eucharist made these men what they were, angels in iron, immovable rocks. In early September, decimated and dispirited from the summer of war, disease and low morale at the news of fresh Spanish troops soon to arrive from Sicily, the Muslim Turks broke upon this Christian rock, packed up their camps and left Malta on the Nativity of Our Lady, September 8th. But when they saw the small size of the relief forces, they were shamed. And they returned for another fight to save their honor. This effort failed even more miserably. And they were utterly routed on September 11th with one of the bays filled with dead Muslims. 
Total Muslim losses, 30,000. This image of a real historical situation is an important type for our own times. What they did there, we are now all forced to do as a whole. In other words, we've been here before. And we are under a siege once again. The desert island of Malta represents that there's no running away from the revolution that is now upon us. To run away from it is only to be captured and enslaved by it sooner or later. Better to turn and face down the revolution at our doors, at our very walls, by seeking to become immovable rocks in its path. And this is only possible through our faith and the Holy Mass. The revolution has technology on its side. They have the neat and fancy equipment, and they are well supplied. They run the internet, the TV shows, the movies, the radio stations, the media outlets. They are theirs. All that tickles the ears and captivates the eye. They get all the support and funds they need to continue, even from our tax dollars. All the beautiful and smart people work for them. The revolutionaries also hold the high ground. They have populated the seats of government worldwide for some time. But sad to say, it also appears that many of their number presently occupy major positions of the church's own hierarchy. What is more, they have big guns too. Guns of executive authority, supreme courts, and legislators. Without fear, they wield these guns, wearing miters and ruling from benches of judges. Such big guns seemingly move around free of care, always getting their way, looking down into our camps. What do we have? The bastions of the holy faith, the barrier walls and impregnable forces of forts named after the angels, barrier walls which include first and foremost the holy mass. Yes, we are surrounded, but we have something that is immovable, the traditional Latin mass. In other words, we do not make this mass conform to us, but rather we change to conform to it. That's a very essential point in understanding the immovability of this Mass. I don't make it fit me, I fit it. I conform to it. Do we realize what we have in this holy, immovable rock? A bastion of the faith behind which to find relief and sure refuge. Peace of soul. When Ireland was being heavily persecuted by the Protestant English, it was the immovable rocks, that is the mass rocks in the glens of the Emerald Isle, that kept the faith alive. All the forces of evil that crashed upon that once faithful land broke upon these rocks, unable to harm the faith even over centuries of renewed efforts of cruelty. Listen to some lines from that memorable Irish song, The Mass Rocks in the Glen, if you've ever heard it. I am proud that I am mountain bred. This is my native place. These mountain glens have ever been the stronghold of our race. "'Twas here our fathers earned the right to bear the name of men. When they kept the faith for Ireland by the mass rock in the glen. Our priests like wolves were hunted down, O oh God, t'was surely hard, that from the right to worship thee thy children were debarred. But still they proudly bore thy cross, those simple mountain men were proud to share thy Calvary by the mass rock in the glen. God bless the glens of Ireland, every rock and mountain pass, 
Twas these same glens that unto God preserved for us the mass. And if the time should ever come when Ireland calls for men, she will not find them wanting by the mass rock in the glen. You want to get rid of the men in Ireland? Get rid of the traditional mass. And you'll get just what they got now. A few more lines. May God bless those fearless men who kept the faith that Patrick saved by the mass rock in the glen. The mass rocks made these Irish men angels in iron, determined, unbending under the very intense and often renewed pressure of revolution that swept over the Emerald Isle for centuries. Seeking to build up the morale of her weakened French army, at the top of the list, St. Joan of Arc insisted they go to confession and attend Mass frequently, as well as keep the fasts and the vigils. She always led by example. As a result, the men were ashamed to be base in her presence. They became chivalrous. When they marched to Orléans, the priests led the army in a sort of procession with crosses and banners displaying the instruments of the Passion, chanting hymns and psalms. Against the advice of her more experienced generals, she attacked the strongest forts and would not cease attacking until they were captured. What were the results? They became angels in iron, unstoppable, able to conquer against all odds, steamrolling a path for the French Prince Charles VII to be crowned and anointed sovereign king of France in a matter of two months. Something that is still amazing to every historian to this day. It was a miracle. When all seemed lost, suddenly everything changed. God loves to work these marvelous reversals. When St. Joan was later held captive by the English, they steadily broke her down by keeping her isolated, surrounding her by evil-minded, impure men, guarding her day and night. But most of all, they would not allow her to attend Mass. She begged, let me attend Mass. Over and over she begged. She could not even attend on Christmas or Easter nor be allowed to visit even the chapel. She was able to visit the chapel a few times, and the bishop found out and said, don't you let her go in there. Having put her through a long trial, they finally brought her out and showed her the stake, the fire, and the wood. She gave way under the pressure of the sight, the words of the clergy, and the din of the crowd around her to sign something that seemed safe. Keep in mind, she could not read, and they did a switch on her. She was double-crossed in the process. Then they forced her to relapse by wearing men's garb again. She was doomed from that point on, as all relapses came under the death sentence. But now, as if by divine decree, her captors let her receive the adicum, a sign to all that she was truly innocent. Although very fearful of burning to death, it was the one thing she feared the most besides treason. Fortified by the bread of angels, St. Joan boldly went to the stake, proclaimed her innocence, sang hymns, and spoke out the holy names of great fervor as she was consumed. All the while she faced a crucifix held before her. When the ashes cooled down, lo and behold, they found her heart untouched by the fire, incorruptible. With the Holy Eucharist, she could not be conquered. Her heart remained firm and unburnable, an angel in iron. At Fatima, the angel of Portugal, who was St. Michael the Archangel, came to visit the three shepherd children to prepare them for the difficult trials ahead. He gave them Holy Communion and taught them how to make reparation for all the wrongs done to the Blessed Sacrament. These little shepherd children soon became immovable rocks, willing to be thrown into jail with adult criminals 
and burned alive in boiling oil rather than betray the secrets of the beautiful lady. Again, we see examples of how the Eucharist makes little men into angels of iron. All these are types. Now the whole world is Malta. We are surrounded. The revolution is everywhere. The whole world is as Ireland was, under intense pressure to give up and give way, to throw out the old and usher in the new. Ireland has fallen. Malta is slipping away. There's a mosque on Malta. They're dialoguing now. Why is this happening? Because there's a fifth column on the inside. To survive, nay, even to turn the tide, we must grab a hold of that which is immovable and cling to it, to share in its immovableness, in its immobility. And that is the Holy Mass and the Holy Eucharist it brings to us. When the marauding Saracens attacked St. Clair's convent, she wisely had the Most Blessed Sacrament brought forth and exposed. The Muslims fell back and fled in terror, leaving the convent unharmed. Here is an easy way to understand the modern Muslim problem and the revolution as a whole. The more we pull away from fidelity to the immovable rock of the Mass, the more the various antichrist forces rise up against us. They see we are defenseless, we have no bastions. The more we make the mass movable, changeable, the more ground we lose to Islam, and the more Catholics fall away to the revolutionary forces of the world. Consider what the Muslims were not able to do over centuries of effort because of the mass rocks used by the Knights of St. John and the bold, courageous people of Malta, they are now doing with relative ease, overrunning Europe. Now we are open to dialogue and making a false peace with such forces. Now we can arrive at these same conclusions in another perhaps more sublime way by turning to the scriptures and the fathers of the church. In explaining Psalm 109, one of the fathers of the church says this, quoting the psalm, the Lord will send forth the scepter of his power. He explains that is the cross. And then it goes out of Zion. That is the cenacle, the upper room. For there the only begotten immolated himself, there he commenced his passion. Okay, what's going on here? The fathers tell us Zion is the upper room, the cenacle. St. Peter says that the cornerstone of the church is laid in Zion. The litany of the saints quotes the scriptures by plainly stating that our deliverance will come out of Zion. St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, begins the sequence for Corpus Christi, Lauda Zion, Lauda Zion Salvatorem, Zion. This means that Catholics are the true Zionists. Worshippers of God in and through the Paschal Mystery made available in the Mass in every place and time it is offered. All other Zionists, false Zionists, seek a political Messiah or a piece of land in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. Losing sight of the heavenly, they become earthly. They cannot see Calvary in heaven through the Mass because they have no sense of humor. Think about that upper room, the cenacle. Now we've identified it with the scriptural term, Zion. It is where everything happened. The first mass, the last supper, the ordination of the first bishops, the apostles, the first meeting of the apostles with his majesty resurrected from the dead on Easter Sunday. And at that time, he granted them the faculties to hear confessions. 
Remember, he breathed on them and said, those sins you forgive, they're forgiven. Those you hold bound, they're bound. It is the place where the doubts of St. Thomas were overcome on Low Sunday. The place where our Lord remained with Our Lady during the 40 days of Easter, according to the mystics, when he was not appearing in other places. The place of the first novena of prayer for the coming of Pentecost with the apostles gathered around the Blessed Virgin Mary. The place where the Holy Ghost came down and from which the church issued forth visibly for the world to see and to join. The apostles left the upper room. In other words, folks, angels in iron to conquer the world. Consider some prophetic lines from the scriptures mentioning this place, Zion. King David mentions Zion in the Psalms many times. It's amazing how perfectly each of these fit with the upper room and the holy mass that was instituted there and everything else that happened thereafter. Here's some examples. We'll go through some. Psalm 13. Remember, Psalm 13 is the one that starts, The fool have said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and are become abominable in their ways. There is none that doth good, no, not one. What a good description of our revolutionary times. Where is the solution to this problem? The psalm goes on. Who shall give out of Zion? Who shall give out of Zion? The salvation of Israel. When the Lord shall have turned away the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel be glad. Out of Zion. Again, it was in Zion that St. Thomas, the doubting apostle, had his reservations resolved, crying out, My Lord and my God. Psalm 19 reads, May he send thee help from the sanctuary and defend thee out of Zion. The Psalms also indicate how those who love the Mass will become immovable rocks. Psalm 124 reads, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion. He shall not be moved forever that dwelleth in Jerusalem. Listen to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda describe the unshakable nature of the consecration first performed in the upper room at the first Mass. She says, the apostles saw that this change, transubstantiation, would take place in so certainly and infallibly that heaven and earth would sooner fall to pieces than that the effect of these words of consecration, when produced in their proper manner by the sacerdotal minister of Christ, should ever fail. Heaven and earth will fall apart rather than the words of consecration done properly by the sacerdotal minister, should fail. Wow. That's pretty powerful. The 16th century Spanish mystic, St. Teresa of Jesus, understood this reality well. As she worked hard at times against stiff resistance to lay down new Carmelite foundations, she only considered the foundation complete and immovable when the first Mass had been offered there. She also knew how important it was to have the Blessed Sacrament reserved at yet another altar of the Church in order to counteract the evil of the Lutherans taking place in the other parts of Europe. She wanted more places for Zion to have its full effect against the rising tide of revolt. Thus, David indicates in the Psalms that it will be through the Holy Mass that the revolution will be reversed. Here's what he says, Psalm 128. Let them all be confounded and turn back that hate Zion. Psalm 75. His abode is in Zion. There hath he broken the powers of bows, the shield, the sword, and the battle. Psalm 125 reads, When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we became like men comforted. When we get back the Holy Mass, we are men comforted. St. Joan of Arc, Jeanne d'Avalette, the persecuted Irish, prove this to be true. All these are proven 
Through the Mass, the church is blessed and made lovable. The Mass is where we find God on earth. Listen to Psalm 49. From the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, out of Zion, the loveliness of His beauty. God shall come manifestly. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Psalm 86. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion above all the tabernacles of Jacob. Psalm 133. May the Lord out of Zion bless thee. He hath made heaven and earth. Psalm 47. With the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion founded, the city of the great king. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God. God hath founded it forever. He goes on, surround Zion and encompass her. In other words, look her over. Get to know her. Tell ye in her towers. Number all her parts. Learn the Mass and love it. Set your hearts on her strength, for this is God, our God, unto eternity and forever and ever. He shall rule us forevermore. Consider finally the Messianic Psalm 109 with which we began this discussion which begins with Christ as the Omega. The first line of the psalm is about Christ as the Omega. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. That's the end. All the enemies are going to be made the footstool. It's over with. In the third verse, it mentions him as the Alpha. It says, From the womb before the day star, I begot thee. Before the day star, before creation... You're the firstborn. So we see the Omega and the Alpha mentioned in the first three verses. How does the psalm describe the Lord's presence between the Alpha and the Omega? Zion. Are we surprised? The upper room, that is the Holy Mass. And it reads, The Lord will send forth the scepter of His power, which the fathers tell us is the cross, out of Zion. Thou rule in the midst of thine enemies. Rule in the midst of thy enemies. Awesome. After the third verse, King David mentions how the Christ will rule throughout time through the eternal priesthood of Melchizedek, which is the right according to bread and wine. This is the priesthood of Jesus Christ the right that renews his holy sacrifice. Thus the psalm says, The Lord hath sworn and he will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Through this priesthood and the holy mass he offers, God will conquer the whole world. Because the psalm goes on and says, The Lord at thy right hand hath broken kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among nations he shall fill ruins. He shall crush the heads in the land of many. Again, St. John, John de Valette, the Irish, prove this is true. But let's look at one more thing. We have Zion, the upper room. And when our Lord left Zion, where did he go? He went to the garden and he went to Calvary. The beloved Bride of Christ, the Holy Catholic Church, with all her members who are awake and have faith, the 99, she, the Bride, has now left the upper room. We have been in Zion. We have the immovable rock. And now it is time for our Lord to seek the lost sheep. He must go out into the garden, and we have to go with Him. We've been told to pray in many different ways as he once again enters in an agony, but this time in his mystical body, the church. We're wondering how we will endure what is before us. Can we handle it? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How tempting it is to medicate and just go to sleep. For his majesty, an angel came down from heaven to comfort him on that fate-filled night, helping him as he took on all our weaknesses and became weak himself. 
But when he, the Christ, left the garden, he was filled with determination. Determination to climb to the height of Golgotha, leading the way for all willing to follow as angels in iron. Let us take a closer look at what the angel really did for the end of this conference. What kind of comfort did he provide? For it appears the very same is being offered to us. First we note how there is something very becoming in the picture of the angelic consolation. It's very fitting. In the trial of the angels, at the very beginning of creation, before God made Adam and Eve, many of the angels had been faithful, the majority. A third fell and two-thirds were faithful. They had bowed down before the God-made man. They saw the Christ and they bowed down. When the time was full, an angel announced his coming, St. Gabriel. When the Lord came on Christmas morning, man took very little notice of him, but the skies were thronged with angels singing his glory. When he lay in the desert, exhausted in body, tempted by the devil, we read, Behold, angels came and ministered unto him. We do not wonder then that this third time, when again he is deserted by man and tempted and harassed by Satan, an angel is visible at his side and gives him the succor that as man he needs. Thus is our Lord's prayer heard. O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this chalice pass from me. But let us notice something. The answer to the prayer is very different from the words of the petition. He asked that the chalice might be removed. Instead, it was made yet more bitter by the continued neglect of his three chosen apostles, by the coming ever nearer of the traitor and his band, by his own growing weakness and inability to resist. But there comes along with all this, not mere comfort, but increase of strength. His prayer was answered. He was given strength. Not relief from his burden, but the power to endure yet more. Not an end to the agony, but the courage to pray the longer. Not rest at long last upon the soft grass, but resistance even unto blood. So that his sweat became as drops of blood trickling to the ground. Is there anything more sublime and yet more human than that blood-bathed body? So does God hear our prayer. So much farther does God see than we. When we ask for rest, for consolation, He prefers to make us heroes. Jean de Valettes, Joan of Arcs, angels in iron. And when it is over and we look back, we thank Him that not our will, but His has been done. There's no exception to this rule. Think about it. What a transformation takes place after this third prayer and visit of the angel. To the end of the passion, no matter what men may say or do to His Majesty, we shall never see him falter or broken again. Always, henceforth, he is master, displaying unparalleled dignity and serenity. He has unflinching moral strength for himself, except such as may depend upon his poor, worn-out body. And he has strength for everyone about him, helping everyone to... He meets along the way strength in every word and gesture. We look on amazed. We wonder whether we have understood or right. And yet ever since, we see the same illustrated in those who seek their support in the Holy Mass and the Most Blessed Sacrament, as I've tried to show you tonight. They become angels in iron. 
How tempting it is to look at our current situation and say, where is the good shepherd? Many are echoing the scripture saying, where is your God? Yes, it seems that God has pulled back. Why? Among other reasons, we are his 99 faithful sheep left behind. Left behind to cooperate with him in saving a world that is arguably worse than ever as it continues in its downward spiral fueled by the rejection of Christianity. We must do now what the saints have always done, redouble our love for the traditional Mass, remain immovable in attending it and embracing what it has to offer, ever seeking to conform ourselves to it, not it to us. When we are attacked and injured, we must do what the good knight of St. John did, make our way to the altar of God and offer our sacrifice and be willing to die for the good of the church and the glory of God and the salvation of souls. We must be like Jean de Valette, unwilling to give any quarter to a false peace or empty dialogue. The prophet Isaiah captures many of these points in his fourth chapter. This is a quote. And it shall come to pass that everyone that shall be left in Zion and that shall remain in Jerusalem, read here the upper room, the Holy Mass. All that shall remain in Jerusalem shall be called holy. The Lord shall wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall wash away the blood of Jerusalem out of the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every place of Mount Zion, in other words, wherever the Holy Mass is offered in the world, and where he is called upon a cloud by day and a smoke and the brightness of a flaming fire in the night. For over all the glory shall be a protection, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shade in the daytime from the heat and for a security and covert from the whirlwind and from rain, end quote. That fits. That's it. This is our immovable rock. This is our bastion of the faith. This is where we're made angels in iron. Lessons we've learned tonight. First, we cannot run away. We must hold firm, resisting the revolutionary forces of the world like rocks in a flooding river. Malta acts as a type of how this has been done before and can be done again. Second, the Holy Mass is Zion for us. It is lovely, it is powerful, it is unshakable. It is what makes us remain firm as angels in iron unto the end, to remain immovable rocks. Therefore, we need the Mass and the Holy Eucharist. We must love the priesthood that brings it to us. The more these are abused, the priesthood, the mass, the Eucharist, the more ground and people we lose to the Muslims and the revolutionary forces of the world, to immodest and impurity and sin and vice and atheism and agnosticism, new age and Satanism. Third of all, be sure to meditate on the passion of our Lord to understand the Mass and the passion of the church we're experiencing. Meditation is essential for understanding what we're passing through. I gave you a meditation tonight on the agony in the garden. And finally, those who hold firm to this rock will be rewarded with a reversal of fortunes that only God can produce. Let us look forward to that day, immovable in our faith, in our hope, and in our charity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.